So uh, today I'm going to talk about one topic related to data management and it's concerned about open licenses. Uh, but I'm going to speak uh, from the perspective of a researcher and I'm going to give you an overview and use cases, not just focused on data, research data, but also to other uh, parts of the research compendium and research uh, results. Um, so a very similar lecture was held for the Leuven University in Belgium. I was called to uh, give that presentation, so I have to uh, note you about it. And they asked for such a long training, but as David said, uh, we are going to have a break at some point during the presentation, so you can grab a cup of coffee or maybe ask questions. So um, I am uh, coming from University of Belgrade, and this is actually not the photography of the building of the rectorate of the university. This is the building of my faculty where I'm sitting right now. I'm associate professor in biomedical engineering at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University of Belgrade. I'm also a visiting researcher at the University of Ljubljana and guest associate professor at the military academy here in Belgrade. I'm also having more than six, experience, six years of experience in the industry. I've been developing medical uh, devices for therapy and diagnostics. And what's more important for you and for this presentation, I've been sharing my data and software. And since 2018, I was involved in many open science initiatives in Serbia and in general. Um, I'm one of the founders of Open Science Community Serbia. I led some projects related to um, open science. I'm also editor of one conference that relates to open science and I'm active uh, research data alliance member. So I'm, I'm not going to, to talk about all of this, but just to let you know about my um, background in, in the topic. Um, so, um, when you speak about open science, the basic idea of open science is not what um, some researchers might think, uh, getting money to uh, have published results and paying uh, article processing charges. Actually, basic idea of open science is that all knowledge should be freely shared and disseminated. And when I say knowledge, I don't think just like scientific or conference papers. I think also about data, software, or even hardware. So um, in that idea to be able to share our knowledge or to reuse already shared, we need licenses. Uh, so the licenses present an important aspect of open science. And if you have research output, either yours or someone else, or for example, like research data shared without license, then reuse is not possible. So the license give you, gives you instruction, what can you do or what other people can do with your data. If there is no license, then um, you should, even though it's available on the internet, even though it's downloadable, you should contact the author of the data uh, to get a permission, or in case you're out of the data, you're going to get a lot of emails asking, people asking for your permission. Um, I, I have to give one uh, specific disclaimer uh, for giving this presentation, because licensing is actually um, a law job for the lawyer, so I'm not a lawyer, and for any adequate legal advice, you should uh, seek experts, legal experts' opinion and not mine. And this is a very simplified version of um, the point of view from the researcher, how researcher understands and use licenses. And I'm quite aware, actually, I've never been to a lecture where a lawyer talked about licenses, but I, I watched some of the lectures recorded online and I must say they, they tend to be less understandable for researchers and people who actually implement and use these things. So um, basic idea of license, you can even see it in my first slide. This photography is not my own. I used it from the internet and I could use it because there is a license, maybe you recognize this, uh, CC by. There is a license work and I acknowledged it. So I'm super to go and I can share also my 
on license online and to everyone else. So um, what is a license? I will try to give you a simplified definition of it. Uh, besides it's a legal document, it allows you to do something that's otherwise forbidden. So for example, a uh, driving license. You can't drive a car unless you have a specific license to do um, uh, activity that's not permitted otherwise. So uh, in that sense, License gives me the right to copy the image, which I did not create it as I did on my previous slide. So why do you need licenses uh, in practicing open science or in your research careers? For example, you want to use a figure from a published paper for your own doctoral dissertation to show it in them. Um, you would like to use an image from the internet. You would like to uh, analyze the data created by others and shared on the internet. There is a hardware design that you would like to copy and build your own device, or uh, you would like to share your research output the best way you can so the others can use it and hopefully um, cite your paper and your data as well. So um, I, I think I already gave you an idea why do you need to um, know about licenses, but we, we live um, in a slightly different environment than science used to be like 30 or 50 years ago. We are surrounded by internet, we are surrounded by new technologies, and if we want to use everything that we have around us, and um, I, I think the surrounding is very well uh, for prosperous research in science, then we should probably properly understand um, how the things function and how they work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there are two basically two scenarios that you should be aware of, and I think I mentioned it earlier, but just to make sure that you understood. To share your materials the right way, you need to know to set a license or at least not to write a license, that's a legal job and that's for lawyers. I would never advise you something like that, but to choose a available license and to use any material, you have to understand the license that creator had put on it. So I used here a creator as um, someone who can set a license, but who is actually a license setter? Well, it's a license holder, it's commonly a researcher, so if you measure your data or in a team, then your research team um, is a license holder and you can decide uh, on, on setting the license, and commonly this is the case. But you should be aware that there are different employment contracts. I've been working in the industry and I can tell you it's one thing working in at the faculty, university, and academia, and completely another to work in the industry. So you get different um, kinds of um, um, maybe uh, rights to, to be a license holder. And it also depends on your funder, and sometimes it can even depend on your journal. So commonly, um, universities and research institutes develop their own open science policies, so you should be fine in probably 99% of cases, but I had to mention that in some cases, a researcher may not be a license holder. So um, what is there um, to look for at licenses or specifically open licenses when we want to open our research data, research software, or any results? There are three things that you should look for. First one is attribution. Attribution means if you're going to use my data, then please cite um, uh, my data or even my paper. Uh, in, in best case, it's best to cite both. Then there is a couple of requirement. If you want to change my data or to change my software code, I might ask you a specific favor. For example, you want to create a new code by building on my own, then I would like to ask you to share it under the same license. That's what's copyleft about, but I'll get to it because I know this copyleft, copyright things can be quite confusing. And three, there is intent of use. So um, commonly licensors uh, would like to pre prevent commercial exploitation. 
So if you're working for the university academy, you're fine. But if you're a researcher um, and, and you plan your career in industry, even though you work with the R&D research and development with the industry, you should be careful because that might be commercial um, use. So um, there is an option, as I said, that you can create your own dedicated license and write it from the beginning. But I think that's really not a good idea. So not that I'm not advising it, but not anyone will advise you to do so. And there, there, since there is an alternative version so that you can use some of these standard licenses, and trust me, there are many of them, so that you can choose something proper to protect your data or software. So uh, let me tell more about uh, attribution requirement. Um, it's, it's quite simple and logical. So if I shared my data um, and if you want to use it, I would kindly ask you to cite it. So um, it's, it's a requirement from the license what you should do. And usually these are things that you should mention, title, author, um, source, like link to the original page. Um, I don't know, it, it could be GitHub is another repository, but it could be something more domain specific or um, um, software specific like database repository. And usually there should be a link to the license. I don't know, have you noticed, but I'm going to show a lot of images that I did not create and that I used from the internet source and you'll get an idea how it looks like. So um, from the previous slide, I said, for example, if photography stop, that's the title of the image. This is the author, it's Kevin Dooley. Um, it's interesting, but sometimes when you use Flickr images, you know, authors do not use their name and surname, and sometimes they use their nicknames. Um, it's still author, so you, you should say a nickname here. Uh, if you don't find the surname and name, um, then the source, source is Flickr, and this is the link, and then I have a link to the license. So I'm good to go on my uh, on one of my previous slides. Um, the, the problem with attribution may come if there is a public domain image or public domain data or public domain um, software. What it means that something is in public domain, it actually means that legally it does not have attribution requirement. And that legally, um, no one is going to sue you if you don't cite that kind of uh, data or image. But there, there is a different surrounding in academia and different ethical prospects have been uh, said about using public domain um, something that's protected under public domain, like public domain images. So in order to avoid plagiarism, we should cite even public domain uh, in our papers, in our presentations, in our dissertations, or any material that we create. For example, Wikimedia Project tends to cite all public domain images or other uh, work. So uh, also um, public domain, I'll talk a little bit more about it either in one country does not mean the same for another country. So if there is a pamphlet that you're gonna publish in your own country, in your own language, you might be perfectly fine if you're in your country, the image is in public domain. But if you put something on the internet, it's really uh, tricky to, distinguish what's their national domain and what's not national domain. So I would advise you in any way to, to cite public domain materials um, always. So um, I've, I've already said this, but if you want to um, um, get more data on these ethical standards in academia, I'm not going to talk today about it. I've left, I've left some link in this presentation so you can uh, go, for example, to the Library of University of Toronto. I think they have a wonderful resource and also um, Wikipedia uh, has a great resource in public domain citation. So um, when I say public domain, you probably encountered something like this on the internet, and maybe you did, and maybe you didn't notice. There are different marks. So there is this C cross mark, and there is this zero mark. They're different. 
So for example, cross C means that creative work does not have copyright exclusive property rights. So it usually means that the author died and that like 70 years passed from the author's death. So this is the mark C. They're both in public domain. There's no difference, but the difference is how these um, books, images, or data finished in public domain. And there is a zero public domain. This is when author decides by, themse by themselves to release something in public domain. So the, the author might be alive so or not, but that's um, their decision. So um, then I mentioned something with the, which is copyleft, and I'll get back to it also, but um, to be more clear with the terms, I know there are a lot of terms, but please be patient, I hope that everything will be clear to you. Uh, copyleft is a term that's used for software licenses. When you have um, something like general purpose licenses, usually used for images, and for data, like Creative Commons licenses, then copyleft, synonym for copyleft is share alike. So it's a requirement from a license um, to, to set it. And if you're sharing your data with a Creative Commons license, you can say that it is a specific Creative Commons license that involves share alike. So if anyone changes your data, they should share it under the same license. And there is a good thing um, behind it. So the idea is, if someone gave something to you, then it's expected that you should give something in return to, uh, I don't mean like a person to person, I mean like a public interest. If one person uh, has made public interest by giving um, their data available, by share like, then they expect that you, if you use that data, also give something in return to the public. Um, so this is copyleft, but copyright is something different. Um, copyright is something that's given to authorized parties. Um, it's, it's connected to licenses, but it's not um, like copyleft is um, a property of license. Um, copyright is the dominant way to protect intellectual property and it, it protects author's work. So if we say that something is in public domain, then there is no copyright. It expired. Okay, so I, I use this example from the Belgium because initially I was um, giving this uh, presentation to the um, Leuven University, but you can check from um, copyright rules by territory. If you go to this link and you can check how it works in your own country. In Belgium, for example, copyright protection lasts for 70 years after the death of the author. So if it's been 60 years after the death of the author, you have to ask some of the copyright holders um, uh, what can you can you reuse materials? If not, then it's going to be released. Uh, then it's going to be released in public domain. Patent is similar, but it protects the idea, and it lasts really shorter. It's around twenty years. How do we get as a society to the copyright? Well, it happened in Berne Convention in nineteenth century, and they say something like this: If you create an image. Your image, you don't have to do anything to sign agreement, to go to court, to find a lawyer. By creating your own image, you are automatically its copyright holder. That, that's what Penn Convention serves, and it serves to protect your author's rights. So um, um, if you create an image, place it on the internet, and um, there is nothing you say around that image, then copyright applies. No one can reuse that image in presentation before asking you explicitly as the copyright holder. In order to enable someone to take that image, you have to say, okay, this forbidden action, like copying my image or reusing my data, is now going to be uh, allowed by a license. And I'm going to give uh, some rights to the people to um, reuse my own work. So that's what copyright says. 
for and copyleft is something something different and i know that they, they, they sound really really similar if, if you have any questions regarding this i would be really happy to to answer and to make it more clear to, to you all so um since you're researchers this is something that you encounter all the time for example you read a paper or you get to a data or to a website and you see sentences like this and i'm going sorry like this first and this second, and I'm going to explain you uh, both. So copyright C, 2022, sample name, all rights reserved. Author's rights, copyrights, right, belong to a sample name. And if all rights are reserved, there is no license that's given. So you have to obtain written permission. Um, in, in either way, if the, there is no such text, um, it's it's quite simple to realize that there is a copyright and that you shouldn't copy anything. So having this text or not having it, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters in paper is who owns the copyright. So in some cases it's the author, but in some cases it's the journal, because when your paper is accepted, we usually, if it's not open access, assign some agreement that some part or everything of our copyright is giving to the, to the publisher. So there is another sentence. Usually you can see something like this in um, open access papers at the end of the paper. So it says copyright C, a year, sample name, and then it goes like this work is licensed under, and they state the name of the license, which permits, and they tell you what's permitted to do. And, and in the end, it, should, it can contain the under which condition something is permitted. So this means that the author's rights, copyright, belongs to a sample name. It's usually the authors of the paper. And that you can do something with this copyrighted material. And it's written in the license what you can do with it. So I, I hope that you now understand a little bit better um, what this means. So in this um, sense, when you have a license, then um, you can have like copyleft in, in that license, or we said it's, it could be share alike. So you can have a copyright, so it's, it's uh, the right protected by the author, and then you can have a disclaimer in the license that you can share it under the same license and so on. So, I already said that copyrights belongs to the creator um, or to someone you sign the contract with, uh, like the journal. If it's in public domain, then there is no copyright, then it doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to everyone. Okay, so um, to, to get more familiar with the licenses, this was like a general talk, I'm going to tell you a bit more, and I'm, I'm quite sure you, you heard about these licenses, or maybe you even got some lecture about Creative Commons licenses, and I hope it, it will be more clear after this part. Creative Commons licenses are general purpose licenses. Um, they are usually used for uh, protecting images, um, in some cases designs, but I, usually they are used for protecting research data. And I do use Creative Commons licenses when I share my research data with my papers. They're really widely known. Um, not many people know that they were inspired by a free software movement and by licenses created for free software. And the uh, Creative Commons creator, Professor Lawrence Lessig, actually collaborated with the Free Software Foundation when we, he was creating these licenses. Um, there is a good thing about them. They're probably the most widespread licenses. There are really no one around. So it's good to have license like that, that anyone can understand. Um, it's partly due to the fact that Wikimedia Foundation uh, really popularized it. Um, there is a special ingredient in this license which makes them so much popular because they're easy to use and understand. And I believe it's because they're three layer design. So there is one layer that is readable for lawyers. It's called legal code. Um, I never read those, but I can show you that. Um, there is a layer readable for, for humans. <laughs> 
regular humans who are not lawyers, and this is perfect and easily understandable. And there is also part of machine readable things. This is quite important, machine readability, because, for example, if you share your um, data with machine readable license, then, for example, um, search engines like Google Data Start Search uh, can um, distinguish your data. And if someone is going to search, um, give me, I don't know, some kind of data, uh, research data that's protected under Creative Commons license, then that search engine um, can read machine readable code and layer and will provide uh, uh, adequate search. So your visibility is going to be much larger. Um, that's why um, they're so special about these licenses. They're actually really simple, in fact, they give you four rights or limitations, call them as you wish. This one is attribution, and I mentioned it. It's about citing a person. So this logo is quite uh, understandable. There is a share like, so you know, a cycle when someone gives something to a public and the other ones follow. There is no commercial use, and I think this is really quite understandable icon. There is no derivatives work. So this means that if I give you my data, I don't want you to share it again and process it or change it in any way. If I give photography under license, I don't want you to change, for example, color photography into grayscale. So you, there are no derivatives and I'm not going to approve them. So that's why these equalities. So these four rights, four basic things about license, can be combined in following six licenses. Um, so um, you see CC BY, that is Creative Commons license, and you should always cite the materials. So do whatever you want with it, and so on. There are different combinations. Uh, what I like about them, there is a description, like attribution, attribution share like, there is abbreviation like CC BY, and there is this icon, um, derived from the combination of these four rights and four limitations. So this is my sample data um, and software code shared and deposited on uh, Zenodo, a CC BY license for a preprint. Uh, if, you, if you want, after the break, maybe we can go to some specific links and I can show you on the internet how to search for license and how to recognize it and share the data. I use usually my own examples, but we, we can um, search for any other exam examples on the um, internet. So there, there are some specific things about licenses. For example, if you use free software or open licenses, there is usually part, um, a disclaimer that says you're not giving any guarantee. I mean, it would be too much. People who produce software should and sell the software should give a guarantee or guarantee. We are not giving that. So um, usually license contains that. Sometimes, because I'm working in biomedical engineering and maybe some of you can relate to my area of expertise, um, I, I should state that some software, for example, like additional statement, not part of the license, be, but license can also contain such part, is that um, if something is not for medical purpose because it's still in, in research. It, it, it may be important, maybe you have some domain specific things that you want to add, but this is more related to the ways we share our data um, and maybe not um, such domain specific things should not be in licenses. But we'll get to disclaimers as, as well later. So I usually get asked when I talk about this topic, um, how should I license uh, a paper or a preprint? So um, a, a paper, you, you have option the journal provides you, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. But what about preprint? You know, there are many uh, wonderful preprint servers that you can use. And if, for example, I use archive all the time, uh, but I know for psychology, there is a psi archive, and I know there are many domain specific um, preprint servers, some of them being commercial, some of them not. Um, and 
I usually use a CC BY license for my preprints, unless uh, I, I check it all the time, and I haven't seen any of the uh, journals and publishers to, to ask me for a specific preprint license. Something they do sometimes ask for is that you should share your preprint on a server that's non-commercial. So you should be aware of that. It's, it's not actually related to license, but it's related to a place where you can share your license. Um, for example, I found a perfect blog um, on uh, psy uh, how to license your work. So sometimes they do advise people to use CC0. So to, um, uh, to, to place it in public domain and to give all their, to, to give away their copyrights. Um, I'm, I'm not um, very fond of this because um, I, I think it may be a trouble with some jurisdictions, national and so on. So I usually go with CC BY, but you should probably check with your librarian and team. And you should not be, when choosing a license for a preprint, as well for the data, please be aware, are you um, the copyright holder? Because in some cases, your funder um, can have uh, not just a journal or repository or your own institution, even a funder um, can ask for something uh, related to licenses. So be sure to check everything else before you, you do set things uh, like that. Also in uh, medicine, biomedical engineering, psychology, or anywhere where we work with the people and where we, we um, have to respect Helsinki Declaration and to have informed consent, um, you should be aware that sometimes uh, um, the, the consents are given before the author, authors decided, researchers decided to share their data. And in some cases, um, there should there are some uh, things in the consent that prevents you from sharing your data. So plan sharing in advance, even before you create your informed consents for your subjects or patients in a study. It's it's truly important because later on you may not be able to share your data if you do not check the consents and all legal um, re requirements. So. Um, before break, I would like to dive into some practical examples with you to, to get even more clearer picture how to use um, these licenses practically. But before that, I would like to tell you something about pair use. I know the Circle U is European project and that there's probably no one here at this Zoom meeting from the United States. But there is something that applies in the United States and it's called fair use. And maybe you should be familiar uh, with the existence of fair use. So they, they say like this, if um, you're going to use an image from the internet, uh, for example, it's a photography of the device on the, uh, of the commercial product on the website of the producer, and you're going to use it for non-profit educational purposes, like for the lecture to your students or to your colleagues. And um, you're not going to use something like full scale resolution, then you shouldn't ask for permission and you should state that you're using something as a um, fair use. It's a specific um, um, part when you can, uh, violate uh, copyrights and when there is no license to use image and you have justified your purpose to using some image. But I, I can tell you one thing, uh, although it sounds simple and as a great thing, which I, uh, I'm, I'm convinced it is, um, this can be a little tricky. You know, but because sometimes what's nonprofit and what's educational purposes and what's justified can be quite blurry. And in cases you need it sometimes, I also put some wonderful links where you can get more information, um, what is fair use, why people use it, and 
how it, it may need you one day. I'm not going to talk today about this, but I thought it's worth mentioning. So um, let's find a picture on the, on the internet. I, um, for example, wanted to find a picture like personal com computer, I'm an electrical engineer, and this is like my first choice. So um, we can try different things. Uh, these are three sources I use all the time for my presentations. It's Flickr, Wikipedia, Unsplash, but there are also excellent resources for licensed images that you can find on the internet. So for example, if you go to Flickr and place personal computers, there is a special part of the search where you can uh, say, I want only pictures with CC licenses. So then you know that you're searching some licensed work, but be aware, images of Flickr may be copyrighted and usually that's stated under the picture. It's very clear how to, to use it. So how to cite a picture when it's have a license? Well, similar as my previous pictures, I say, this is the title of the picture. This is attribution part, right? And look at this, uh, this uh, person used a nickname like photographer, um, and I have to name it. There is no name in the name, but you have to say this is the author. It's Flickr and this is CC by and C. So this author says that you should attribute them and use it for non-commercial use. And this is actually what I'm doing today. Um, so this is this is that part. So um, I can also do something like this with this picture, because remember. Um, there is also that equation when um, equality, non-derivative works. So this person didn't say that I shouldn't change the picture. So I can modify it in a way I wish. For example, I can from a color image, create a grayscale image. It's a good practice that you say that you modified your photography. And sometimes life and said that to you, actually, you know, you should... Um, specify that you modified photography. I'll go in, into that a little bit later. But this is also a very um, fine thing to do with the data, with the image, with anything you, you wish to. So um, um, what, what actually, uh, how does license looks like? If you go to visit this link, city by NT, um, this is a very long presentation. They made a lot of print screens, not to waste my time by going on, on my Internet Explorer, but I'll have to, to go eventually. If you go to this link, follow it, you're going to get here. It's Creative Commons website, and this is a license. This part is human readable. It's not for, um, uh, it's, it's not for uh, lawyers, so this should be understandable. And they say, um, indicate if changes were made in image, you know, attribution um, and what you should do, you should cite and link the license to your image and there is no uh, non-commercial purpose. But you see this uh, indicate if changes were made and if you go into this part, it, it tells you like this, in 4.0 version of the license, you must indicate if you modify the material in zero in 3.0 and earlier license versions, the indication is only required if you create a derivative, if you create a new image and share it under your own. Why I'm telling you this? Because a good practice, but Flickr um, usually don't contain, usually contains this, but some of the other uh, do not. You can see this is CC by NC 2.0. A good practice is that we give a version of, of the license um, because not all CC by are the same and there are some different um, differences among them. And usually what you're going to find in your papers, 4.0 is the best, of course, because it's the latest, has something to do like international. And I think that very important ingredient of Creative Commons licenses because it's encompassing all country in the world. So wherever you are and on the internet, when you're once on the internet, believe me, you're everywhere, um, the same uh, rights apply. So I think that's quite important um, for the license itself. 
Okay, so um, this is uh, correct also. This is the same image, but I zoomed it a little bit so I can zoom in, I can change the pictures and so on. This is for a personal computer from Wikipedia. And now I would like to share you um, my, my screen because there is something I can't uh, explain easily um, with screen screens so that you can see um, the idea. I have opened the link to this personal computer. So you should be able to see it now. When you go to uh, Wikipedia, you usually get images like this. And there is one part which says open in media viewer. I usually do it. Then on the right click, you can download this image, save images, but look what appears. It appears that you can download the original file. I'm not quite now concerned about that, but I like this one here. Wikipedia warns you that you should cite the image or attribute the author. So you go to here and copy this plain text and place it in your presentation as is, and you're free to go. This is even more easier than referencing images from Flickr, and I find it a, a great way um, how Wikipedia operates. Um, so um, this picture is in public domain, as you can see here. So actually, public domain means that I can even um, legally, I can take this picture and place my name on it, but it's not a good thing to do because uh, I, I wouldn't uh, behave ethically in academia if I would do so. So please go ahead and cite public domain. But these are things you can do. You know, you can change the image, add some text, arrows, whatever you want to it, and, and you're um, fine. So just to, be, to remind you, um, public domain uh, materials have no copyrights. Um, and for some, Authors, as I said, uh, in, in some national jurisdictions, authors cannot give away their moral author rights and, and um, sharing something with CC0 in public domain can be quite tricky. So maybe you should always, my advice, but you, you should do whatever you think or, or get some true legal advice or advice from a librarian. Um, I always use CC, CC by license. So um, um, what, how do you, correct references can be different. So one thing, uh, thing search for Flickr, um, Wikipedia helps you, but for example, sorry, Unsplash uh, is a great resource for images on the internet. And they usually also give you automatically how to cite them, similarly as Wikipedia, when you start downloading, they tell you, please attribute our materials, and this is the correct way to do it. So this is the correct way to do it with hyper hyperlinks um, on the end splash. And um, this is not um, a general purpose license. So if you're using licenses like this, you should check what you can do. So um, I checked with this license and they say that I can download and use free in my work, the photographies. Uh, I can also use it for commercial um, use. Um, I, I don't even have to attribute them. So they, they're just advising you to do so. And it's not allowed to sell those, those photographies or to place it in something. Um, and it, you can tell them th this is really tricky if they're unrecognizable from the source because who, um, who will say that something is unrecognizable? Uh, uh, and of course, they want to prevent, prevent competition. So they say, you know, you can't make compilation supporters or anything else like an Unsplash do. But I, I find it a great resource, and I think these licenses really conform to something that we have in open science, like sharing and reusing um, knowledge. You probably use Google a lot. I'm not going to, you know, like um, advertise them. They're a commercial company, but the fact is they're the widely used um, search engine. And usually when you're looking for a picture, you're going to go to the Google. So I advise you to go 
and um, to explore your options when you're searching images because you can set their usage price and you can even say to Google to show you only uh, images shared by Creative Commons licenses and this is going to be quite easy for you if you're in a search for an image or um, advanced search can help you find data or other materials on the uh, on the internet. I also put here um, a lot of uh, resources that I use, not just for images, but also for open data. Um, I usually find them uh, in general purpose repositories, so I place them here, and I know that you're probably coming from different backgrounds. Uh, but I also use some domain-specific um, repositories for data like Physionet for uh, biomedical engineering, but uh, Zenodo and Figshare, I, th I think they're quite familiar and general purpose and they usually go there when I look for data and they give you an immediate check, you know, um, uh, whether your data is going to be uh, is licensed and what you can do uh, about that um, licenses. So um, don't, don't forget to um, reference images correctly. I know it depends on the style, but um, my advice is to always um, use in your materials when you use images, um, unless like in Unsplash, you don't have to do that specifically to add the license uh, that, that covers your data and um, your images. For example, when I use in my papers, I, I um, reuse others' data available on the internet. I um, state it in the cover letter, letter to the editor, and I state it in the manuscript, the paper, that I use data from the internet, I cite the source for the data, paper of the authors who share the data, and I also cite the, the complete license name with the version, of course, like Creative Commons license, CC BY, uh, International 4.0, um, is the license, to, license used to, to share um, the data. And when I share data with my paper, I do the same. I always cite the, the license. I think that's quite, um, quite important for, for the referencing. Um, unfortunately, we do not have um, standards how you should cite your data, hardware and software other, um, the, that you're reusing in your paper. There are some guidance on the journal websites, you know, and guides how to prepare your manuscript. Um, and they're not quite um, that often at the conference proceedings, you know, when, when you get a um, template how to, to prepare a conference or to cite your data. But nowadays, uh, journals usually state that you should cite the data and they have some requirements. But for example, we didn't have now like um, APA, Harvard, Chicago style for referencing that that applies to, to data. Um, um, but I, I think that that should be changed in the spirit of open science. And if some of them get to my presentation, I hope that I can inspire them to uh, make our job more routinely and to make our shared resources and conveniences more um, visible. So uh, reusing a figure from uh, publication um, it's a bit different than reusing from the internet. So if you're using from the open access paper, you're good to go. Open access papers usually have CC BY or some similar license. And um, in, in some cases, they make it actually so easy to you when you go to the website where the journal is, um, you, they even give you, look, there is a PowerPoint slide or that you can download and in that PowerPoint slide, you already have image in good resolution and you already have shared caption. So people, people do try to find ways to make your life easier when you're going to reuse licensed materials. Um, but this should be really straightforward. And this is one of my papers 
um, uh, published in the open access by CC BY. So you, I usually place, you know, figure one retrieved from them, their go reference, and I say it's licensed under, and you can see 4.0, like the version of the license of the paper, and of course, the image in the paper. But um, the, the real problem arrives when you have to use a figure from non-open access paper. And I know it can be really frustrating because even if you're the author of the paper, if the copyright holder is your journal, you have to ask for permission. Um, I, I know that can be tricky. So um, nowadays, most journals have a service which is really straightforward. You don't have to write email to anyone. You just go there, uh, make a couple of clicks, and then you get automatically um, um, agreement that you can use that figure, for example, from a journal, or that you can use something uh, from, from that paper. Um, what uh, is, could be frustrating is that um, this is a payable service. So sometimes it's going to be completely free. They're not going to charge you anything, but sometimes it can be quite expensive. And I know that for some authors, it's frustrating that even if you're using your image from the paper your author, they, they can possibly ask you to pay something. So uh, what, what is the price range? Well, um, I think anything from 10 euros to, I think for some input that I tried, uh, was like 7,000 euros for reusing one images. So it really it really depends on the journal, on the um, type of the material you want, like many images, some images, and on the purpose that you're using. The image. So what you should do? I'm also not going to visit this website because we, we should soon make, make a break, but um, this, this is a sample uh, journal that, that I used in my, my um, research to cite. Um, it, it's an excellent paper, actually. If you, if you go to the DOI, follow DOI, then you're going to get to the publisher's webpage, and they have a link with, with, which is usually called uh, Rights and Permissions. This link serves if you want to reuse image from, from uh, someone's paper or your paper, even. So um, they lead you to the CCC website, it's called Brightsling, and you start filling out the form. So I would like to, and you make a selection, reuse it in a presentation, in doctoral dissertation. I am, and you say, educator, researcher, um, I'm coming from the pharmaceutics and so on. And if you, um, and if you fill it all up, then they give you an estimate of your price. I must admit something, um, I never use images that they ask me to pay for. And uh, if, if you see some of my presentations on the internet or um, my chapters where I reuse other people's images, well, I did it because when I filled in this form, they said you're going to pay zero euros. So that's, that's how I use it. Um, uh, if there is zero and you decide to use it, are you paying, paying for it or not? Then they give you an agreement. It's like contract. It's automatically created what you can do and what you can't. For example, you may be noticed when you submit your uh, paper to journal, they say if you're using someone else's figure, you have to have a clearance or uh, permission. So this is that kind of a permission that, that you can get. So what if there is no license on the website there is no rights link, or you can you would like to do something that license um, prevents you from. For example, licensors um, said that um, you should not share the, the uh, you should not do the derivatives, right? And you want it to. Well, in that case, you should write an email. Whom you should write is a really tricky thing. You should write your copyright holder. In most cases, it's author, but if you, we are talking about journals, it's not going to be author, it's probably the publisher. And in some cases, if it's a website, you should search for a contact on that website 
and, and, and then write to them and ask who is copyright holder to know where to write your next email. I do write these emails a lot. I did it a lot when I wrote my uh, open textbook because I wanted to have really nice illustrations for my students. And it was really hard to get to all those images. Um, sometimes I receive a confirmation by email, then I print that email to keep it safe. When they say, yeah, sure, use that image, I'm copyright holder, that's perfect. Sometimes I really get a tons of scanned legal documents signed by directors, board of directors, CEO with stamps and everything. Um, sometimes they ask me, you know, we would like you to place this sentence next to your image. That's completely fine. And in some cases, I receive no answer. So I learned something from years in academia. If you don't receive an answer to an email, that's an answer per se. So <laughs> that's what I do. So this is a request form that I usually use. Um, and, and I decided to share it because I, I get a lot of questions how to do that. So if David said, you're going to get this presentation. So copy this email of mine, do whatever you want. I just um, put this orange text that you should change the orange text. And this is how you should find it. I want to use your image from this source um, for, for this. Um, and these are the images, and this is my textbook, and can I get your copyright grant permission for doing so? Uh, please let me know. In 80 or 90% of cases, I got the answer. And um, what is a good thing? Usually um, from a, a small unrecognizable websites or small companies, I usually don't get answer to, from them but from a big scale companies, uh, recognizable laboratories, I usually get an answer and the permission in 24, uh, 24 or 48 hours. So um, the copyright holder is um, an issue, even if you want to reuse materials or you want to set it on your own. And there are different, I, I'm not going to talk about this, but there are different national jurisdictions. I know something about uh, the Netherlands where we have uh, initiative you share, we take care to protect their researchers from the journals and from signing and giving up on their copyrights. Uh, I, I, I think there is something in France, but I, I didn't manage to, to get all these national initiatives very, very well, but you should check with your librarian and institution um, this, this as, as well. Then now we put to the part of software licenses or to explain you how it all started. I already mentioned that CC licenses were created in an agreement and inspired by free software. So sharing software has a um, longer history and there are many initiatives. This one is European initiative that if someone is going to use public money or if you prefer prefer uh, money from taxpayers, then taxpayers should have something in return, should see the source code of the data. So there is a, an initiative, public money, public code campaign by the Free Software Foundation Europe. It exists even outside open science. Um, so uh, the, this is basically how it all, it all um, started. So um, somewhere in the 60s and 70s of the last century, um, some companies realized that they can make a great profit out of software, but software was hard to sell because it's no material product. And they developed some models how to do so, um, which in some cases were uh, and still are absurd. And they introduced the control of copying in the software world in order to prevent people, you know, for reusing their product without paying money to them. And um, there was a revolt of the programmers, um, which led to the rise of free software. And its, it's founder uh, was actually an employee at the MIT um, uh, faculty. And uh, mostly this revolt 
uh, was directed towards one um, letter that Bill Gates, you can even find all this information online, um, that he wrote, it was an open letter to hobbyists where he announced that the software is going to be a major product, uh, which we probably have witnessed a lot. Well, um, about 10 years later, Free Software Foundation um, was established and one of the most important things that they developed is a software license. So uh, they said, okay, we can't fight um, copyright introduction in the software world and big companies, but we can create something that will enable people to freely share and enjoy reusing and sharing software. So that's how the, the licenses are developed. So their revolt led to the definition of copyleft. So you, you probably do get it because they want to fight copyright. That's why they called share, share like copyleft. And that, that's why today we have so many concerns about that. But I believe that if you get a little bit of history, how it all started, it will be much clearer to you because that's how it went for me. So um, what, what is actually um, free software? Um, the, the definition of free software lies in the core freedom. They, they usually uh, number it from zero to three. So the freedom zero is to run the program for any purpose as you wish, to study how it works, the freedom one, freedom two, to redistribute the copies, to create the copies and be free to redistribute them. And uh, freedom three, uh, to distribute uh, copies of your modified versions. And I've put it in, I, I usually don't like to do this in my presentation to emphasize letters, but I put this to in, in bold because I wanted to emphasize that for practicing two freedoms, you need access to the source code. And usually when we buy software products, we don't get access to a source code. And this is a very important precondition. So any software, that complies with these four freedoms and any license that um, um, gives you these four freedoms is free um, software. So there are some terminology misconceptions. Probably not all of you are coming from uh, the electrical or software engineering. So the, this may be important to, especially to you, but I've noticed in my experience that many engineers do, do not know the difference. Uh, there is open source initiative, and maybe if you heard for open source software and free software, you maybe heard it separately. Well, they are synonyms, but the clash and, and um, the conflict existed. It lasted for years, and it's finished. It's nearly, it's not yet, I, I believe, 10 years, but it's around like time of that. Um, because the conflict between open source initiative and free software foundation is now long gone history. And in order to um, emphasize that the conflict is over, there is usually this common abbreviation that you may, may um, um, seen already. It's free open source software or before. Sometimes people from free software community use FLOSS because um, there is a, a one problem in English, free um, like no price and free as freedom uh, are the same wo word. So they use Libre from Spanish, Spanish word, um, word. And usually they say free Libre open source software. And, and they usually just refer in, in their uh, official documents that when they say free, they mean free speech and not free beer. So um, also be aware this is one common misconception. Second common misconception is that people usually believe that freeware is free and open source software. It's not correct. Um, uh, freeware is commonly a business model. A business model when you can use freely the application of the internet, but the um, owner, commercial owner, has the right at some point to tell you, okay, now your free time is done and you now have to pay for our service and you never get to see the source code. So be aware of that because the, the words are very um, similar. Freeware is commonly a business model, but unfortunately, in most cases related to the malware applications, um, not well intended applications. So the first very successful license and currently the most widespread uh, license of the free software world 
is the GNU GPL. So I, I know that people from electrical engineering and, and the computer science tend to use a lot of abbreviation. So I'm just going to start by explaining what's GNU and what's GPL. GNU uh, is a recursive acronym. GNU is not unit. So um, and it, it has to do with the history of how Free Software Foundation was founded because they wanted to make a new operating system that will be like Unix, but unlike Unix because it's going to be a free software. And probably uh, no matter what background you have, you heard for the Linux. This is when they only have a vision of Linux and, and nothing. It, it wasn't even, you know, like started being to work at how it's Linux and today is the most popular operating system where all, almost all world servers work on, on it and, and maybe a lot of personal computers. So that's what GNU refers from. GPL is the abbreviation from the general public um, license. There are different types of licenses that cover free software, and you should also be aware of that. Probably, um, if you want to dive more into it, you, you should go to the Free Software Foundation website, but I'm going to give you some glimpses over that so that you can understand it more. A GNU GPL is a um, restrictive license. There are liberal free software licenses, but there are also restrictive licenses. Um, restrictive licenses have share like, so it's copyleft. They said, firstly, when they share their code, um, they, they didn't do it with this uh, share like principle. So what happened? Um, commercial producers said, oh, look, there are a bunch of programmers, researchers sharing their code openly. We're gonna use their code and we're gonna make products out of that and even get more money for nothing. So uh, programmers wanted to uh, protect themselves from that. So if you, if commercial exploiter is going to use this kind of a code, they should create open product with open source. And of course, you, you may uh, imagine that software industry was not very fond of this. They didn't like it. And they even called it a uh, new general public virus because it is, because it's spread like an infection. If you want to use programmer's code that's under this license protected, then you're not going to sell your product anymore like, like you did it before. And, and programmers felt like they're protected from the abuse from the industry. And that's how the copyleft, you know, like, like um, um, talented part of the copyright was, was coined. And actually, it means it's a synonym for a share life. So uh, I usually use GNU GPL to share um, my results. And this is, uh, I, I share code commonly on GitHub because I do not have a specialized data, um, software repository. I share my data on Zenodo. I do not have specialized, specialized research data repository. So I use these general principles. Software engineers and electrical engineers love GitHub. And uh, when, when you do have your license, when you go to a repository, you get something like this. You know, this repository contains like readme file um, with explanations, um, R code, and there is a license. You, you get, you know, um, pretty simple license. You choose your license and you attach it to your repo um, within GitHub, it's quite simple. I'm not going to go into the details, but there is one thing. If you go and open some kind of a repo and you can open my own, um, you get here an information about license and it, that is GPL 3.0. And remember about licensing, it's quite important that we place a version of the license and um, GitHub um, exactly led me to this. If you click on this, this is still my wrapper on the license, I really like this readability, you know, it's quite simple. So it says, you're permitted to use commercial use, modification, distribution, patent, privacy use. These are conditions. You should, you, you can do a product, but you're going to put it open, like share your source code, and it has to be the same license. You have to disclose source beside me to state the changes and modifications if you're changing my code. 
and you have to let the license copyright notice. And these are limitations. I'm not going to give you, um, for my code, not even warranty of liability. You're going to use it um, in your own responsibility. So this is how, for example, GitHub and most repositories function. So search for this like a uh, human readable short notices that are really useful for researchers. If you want to go more into legal things, there are 674 lines of this license, like legal notice. Um, to be honest, I've never read it in my life. This is something lawyers do, and this is something free software foundation does. For researchers and for any anyone else, this is something Creative Commons do or other licensed, um, you know, uh, writers or creators. There is um, one problem that you may have because GNU GPL is a perfect, and I would really advise you to use that kind of license, copyleft software license. But there, there can be one problem. Imagine that uh, you are going to uh, create a library, a package, a toolbox for the software. I, I, I believe you're all familiar with that, with that kind of terminology. And if you share it um, uh, under GNU GPL, any program that uses this package should be GNU GPL. And in some cases, that's not even possible. And you're going to prevent a wider use of your package. So that's why they introduce specific type of a li license that's called um, <clears throat> GNU Letter General Public License. And it's usually, it usually usually serves for uh, protecting a whole library, a whole package toolbox under the free software license. There is also GNU Affair General Public License that is useful for cloud computing because they uh, at some point, there, there is something they, that people called cloud. Um, some engineers are not very fond of that term. I have to warn you about that because cloud is just someone else's computer <laughs> that you have access to. And they notice that if you're going to do some computing in the cloud, it will be really in the spirit of the free software and open source that you can have the access to the source code the program that is run on the server, the so-called cloud. So um, they then created new affair general public license when they noticed the need for it. And also they noticed another need, you know, creating the software is not enough. You have to have a lot of metadata and be aware of that when you share your data, you're gonna need a lot of metadata and explanations for others to reuse your data. For software, it's the same. So they notice a need for a specific license for a documentation. So they created new free documentation license and they have freedom to tell you this license is not perfect. It's not that easy to use. And the problem that Free Software Foundation had with this license was actually uh, one of the reasons why they collaborated with the Creative Commons and why Creative Commons licenses were um, um, there um, created in the first place. So, um, I'm not, I'm going to show you a table, a review of some licenses later, free software licenses, but now I want to tell you why I use GNU GPL because I have a perfect thing on my mind. First, um, if someone wants to use your GNU GPL program for a proprietary software, for example, a company, see, company sees a great potential in your software, and besides it's free, um, researchers use it, researchers share it, that's perfect. But for example, someone wants to make a product out of it and that's perfectly fine, but they can't do it with GNU GPL because they, want, they don't want their software product to be available as source code. Then they have to write me an email and to ask me for a special permission. And that's where something that's called dual or multi-licenses comes. So, for example, I come to negotiate with that company and they say, you know, we're going to pay you just to use your code in our product. And then I say, OK, I'm satisfied with the price and I'm going to give you especially you a special license. And that's actually that has actually happened. And one of the most famous cases is the fastest 
Fourier transform of the vast. So uh, if it's shared by GNU GPL by MIT researchers, it's still available on the GNU GPL and Python, GNU Octave, or other free software programming languages use it. But for MATLAB, which is proprietary software to use it, um, Matteo Frigo and Steven Johnston created special license for MATLAB, and it's quite open. They um, there is even um, um, a sum that they received. Uh, software engineers would tell today this is really low sum, <laughs> but uh, this was really long time ago. Um, a sum that they received for the MATLAB to take um, the code and to lock it into their proprietary software. So if you share on the GNU GPL, um, surely you're not going to be, um, you know, um, someone may decide not to use your code because they don't want to use the same license, but you may eventually, if the code is good, get paid by the company. So there are um, different type of licenses that they're not going to contact you. That, that company can, you know, um, close your code without asking you are called liberal or permissive uh, floss licenses. And it's not just that Free Software Foundation writes them. There are also different universities that write them. For example, I really like the software license from the Berkeley uh, uh, University because they say, right, you can lock our, our code, but we would like you to, you know, um, say some nice words about our university and they have something that's called advertising clause. So if, for example, MATLAB or any proprietary software is going to use uh, something shared by BSD, and you can also use, it's not just for the Berkeley University stop and students, it's, it's for anyone, it's international license, then they should, you know, mention your name, your university, and so on. I really like that license. So um, remember that being liberal or restrictive, any free and open source license should conform to the four freedoms I showed you and should have uh, source code available. So there are different licenses people use, restrictive and liberal, and you can dive more into this selection um, if you wish. I just mentioned them, and this is just coming what I mentioned. Uh, only if you have some questions, I will go in detail into, into this. So now um, we, we can set a bunch of hypothetical researches, uh, research questions, for example, what would researcher um, love um, to use? Uh, for example, researcher would like to deposit software, which is their own code, and you want to require others who modify their code to release it under the same license. So researchers want a copyleft free software license. They don't want to release a library, so it's quite simple. They want GNU GPL. Another case says that researchers would like to deposit research data. Data is within the scope of copyright and related rights as they created it, and their jurisdictions have such a demand. So they're copyright holders, right? So they can set a license and they can have clarified this. Who should you ask? Your librarian, desk help, funder. Um, there, there is usually someone at your university you can turn. Uh, two, they allow, they would like to allow others to make a derivative and to share derivative under the same license. So this is also easy. They want to do the same, but for data. So we are going to use CC license. By is, you know, they want attribution and SC is share like similar like copyleft here. If these scenarios were quite easy for you to use, then there is a public license selector on the GitHub that GitHub has created and it incorporates a lot of licenses, probably not them all that exist there, but you should ask a question similar like this, determine your scenario and they are going to propose you um, a license for your need in case you can't decide. So there are different, um, besides software, data, images and documentation, that different sets of licenses. And the newest trend is the production and the rise of machine learning licenses. I know that you have different backgrounds and I'm not going to do 
um, to, to get into many technical stuff here. But I want to tell you that they had a Montreal declaration um, in 2017 that, that was announced. And there is a special need for um, machine learning. They have different kinds of dependencies. Machine learning is not just about software. So that, that's the main point. They're tightly connected to data because machine learning models, you know, um, uh, um, parameter, parameters of the model are set by data. So that kind of a software is tightly related to data. If you take different data to train your software code in your model, you're gonna have different parameters. That's why they're toughly tight. Um, they also need to have documentation so they need to be worried about licenses. A licenses for the software, licenses for the data may differ. And there is also an issue in software compatibility, but I wanted to make you sure that you know that there are two trends currently. One trend is that there is a pair of principles, you probably heard about them, that they want to make um, machine uh, learning models findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Fair principles for machine learning do not exist currently. And there are initiatives that deal with this. And they're solving this issue as we speak. And there is another issue that comes um, mostly from the industry. You know, they do want to release uh, their machine learning models openly and their source code, but they're concerned about some misuses of machine learning models. So they decided to create responsible artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning licenses. These licenses are called open, their software code is available, but they're not in many cases free software licenses. If you remember free software freedoms, freedom zero says, that you can use your code for any purpose you wish. Here, they want to you know, prevent some purposes. For example, they want to prevent commercial or production purposes, military purposes in the service of nuclear technology, purposes of surveillance, and so on. I just give you an excerpt from one of the created machine learning license. I would also like to warn you about one thing. These licenses are new. They're not that familiar. And um, in, in the thing I don't like about them, they um, are not international. So be aware what's your country of origin, because you might have troubles as these licenses uh, may have some national um, jurisdiction inside of them. Um, you, you can read the um, um, summaries, you can read, read the whole licenses. Um, maybe they're, they're going to have different, um, different versions that are going to comply to the free software, but I'm, I, I'm, I can't tell you. There is one thing I like about these licenses, it's the layers. So they have different licenses, for, for example, for data, workflows, softwares because machine learning models are really complicated and if you're you may be aware of this as reuser or or their creator uh what what's maybe a good thing uh since these um, ray licenses are, are still in the rise and we're going to see how are they going to behave in practice currently the most popular uh image classification and object de detection, machine learning, and deep learning models are shared with something that we can, you know, connect to. Are shared uh, either on public domain, either on uh, with CC licenses, and majority of them with free software licenses like um, Berkeley license, MIT license, um, GNU GPL, and so on. I took this uh, example. And um, it, it's quite interesting because this, this comes from the creators that, uh, you know, the darknet is the main where they, they shared this uh, very, very um, um, popular YOLO model um, to, for real-time object detection. And they said uh, their domain is public domain. 
do whatever you want with it. So this is Freedom 113 software. And please stop emailing me about it. So the, don't tell me what are you going to use it. This is very popular. So I believe those authors probably got hundreds or thousands of emails before placing this um, in, in their place. So, so currently, you, you should be just aware of the principles for creating rail responsible AI, AI licenses, but we should still wait to see their um, implementation in practice. Uh, this is what YOLO can do in cases you're not an expert, and it can it do in, in real time. I find it quite useful, and this is why it's so um, actually popular. So another set of licenses is the hardware. It's really um, absurd or funny, or name it as you wish, that we define licenses for software because software is non-material product and, and we want, Free Software Foundation actually wanted to liberate the software. And in the end, we finished by defining licenses for something that's really material, tangible product like hardware. But hardware licenses, do exist and um, they're really uh, legally complicated because uh, with license you protect something you can digitize. You, you, you know, image is a digital object, software, uh, software code is a digital object, documentation as well, but hardware is something tangible. You know, you, you can't, you can digitize schematics, but you can't digitize hardware. So um, widely known license selector, um, besides those GitHub, choose also incorpor incorporate hardware licenses. Um, what could be hardware in your research? For example, measurement de device uh, for psychology, the eye track uh, uh, for, for biomedical engineers, measurement of electrophysiological responses and, and so on. And uh, special hardware licenses, they're different licenses. I'm not going to go into details. Um, there is, um, for example, CERN, European Organization of Nuclear Research proposed three licenses and they created them by looking at uh, GNU uh, GPL licenses and by um, looking at Free Software Foundation, what they did. There is, this, uh, there is the same task in amateur pocket radio license, similar to GNU GPL, and they're commonly built on known software licenses to serve the hardware, oh, sorry, to serve the hardware purposes. So either you're an engineer or not, you probably heard about Arduino boards. They're quite um, familiar, widespread. You know, maybe many people don't know, this is for my lab um, image. So this is actually a licensed product of their creator, but as creator released schematics, it's quite um, legal for from anyone in the world to use that schematics to create their copy of the board to sell it to earn money from it. Uh, but they are prevented to use this Arduino name and their logo. Okay, trademark is the only thing protected. So you see this uh, creator of the copy and the user of of their schematics um, uh, respected that. But uh, um, what's really more in interesting is that the original creator, that this did not protect them to earn a lot of money. And that's why I, I um, put this global net sales just to get an impression how big market is for the open hardware. Um, open hardware also um, uh, is very in line with open science practices because our research product is not just data and software, and sometimes it is actually an uh, hardware. And if we have a proper licenses to, to protect our hardware and to share it, we can do it. Arduino was actually created and shared before hardware licenses were even introduced. And this is its, its original genetics. For someone who knows engineering, this is quite enough to create this one. So this is really interesting. And you can now recognize the license, it's CC by, um, CC by and it's chair like license. You see this, this, this image below, it's quite interesting. So there is even like, there is a free software foundation, there is open source hardware association. 
they work a lot with scientists. They do also certification um, um, of, of hardware products. They can do it for your paper as well. But I wanted to show you something which is good principle when we share our paper, our code and everything else. They have, they say that if you have your research hardware, open hardware, you should use three set of licenses. Specific license for your product. I, I choose this BioAmp uh, EMG pill. It, it's a for biomedical application. So they choose certain license for hardware. They have a software that runs this hardware, and they choose MIT license, and they have documentation that covers this software and hardware, and they choose CC BY documentation. So um, if if you're going to share your your, your data your code, maybe it's, it, it would be wise to share your data and code separately. I, I do that, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes I share it the same, which is not actually a good option. The best option I, I do and the best of my practice from experience is that I share code on the GitHub. I use software license. I share my data on Zenodo. I use CC license and I cite them both together on Zenodo, I cite GitHub, on GitHub, I cite Zenodo, they both cite my paper and my paper cites both of them. So th that's actually the best practice that, that, in my opinion, that I do. So, so this is also that you can, you can see what, what this um, software and hardware is about, and you can see here open source license and OSHA certification number. So it's, it's not still digital object identifier or any um, permanent identifier, but it, it is relevant identifier. So uh, hardware openness, I don't know are you familiar with that, is very important for a scientific reproducibility and there are numerous of scientific papers saying how many our countries, our universities, our funders can save the money if we would have scientific equipment that's open source hardware. That, that's really important stuff. And hardware openness in industry in general is important because it can save lives. Uh, I don't know, do, do, do you know about this, but patent ordered by Niels Bolin from the World War was a three-point seat belt that we use even today. And there is some estimate even how many lives have Niels Bohlin saved by releasing this belt to be used by any other car producer. You know, I, I know that for the companies, it's, it's all about earning money, but sometimes, you know, we have to think about public good as, as well. There are also different initiatives that you should be aware of. In some countries, it's forbidden um, legally to repair uh, hardware. In some it is, so take a look if you're a national jurisdiction, but there is also um, a right to repair European initiative where um, a, a, a right to, to know how the, the um, instruments function may be sometimes crucial, um, not just uh, for any purpose, but for scientific um, pur purposes. There are many things beyond licenses that involve good practices like fair principles uh, that you should be aware of because good practices in, in science involve licenses, but that's, that's definitely um, not enough. Um, my presentation may have not lead uh, um, to one conclusion at all. Um, I believe that research is transformed that um, and, and it's still transforming and that we definitely need new skills to use them adequately and to uh, progress, to, to maximize our progress. I, I think I learned a lot learning from others, of course, and, and from my own experiences, but I, I think there is still place, not just for me to transform and grow, but probably for everyone um, else, many people, Help me here and, and from Circle U, I want to uh, give special thanks to David Tidbone and, and Miloš Vojčić from the University of Belgrade for organizing this. Um, workshops, um, I'm, uh, as David said, this uh, presentation is going to be available to you and I play CC BY. I'm just, this is not the end of the presentation. 
Um, besides the light of the presentation, um, you may ask yourself, could I do that? Because when you license presentation CC BY, I use some images that are not just CC BY, but are CC BY NC or CC BY ND. Um, should I do that? Well, um, when you license uh, a presentation, license applies to anything that doesn't have license in it. So if it was my photography, uh, then it, it, and if I haven't stated the license, then it's going to be CC BY. If I stated the license, then you should look what I stated below the image. So that's why we should state license below the image. And um, this problem refers to the license compatibility, with, which can be really tricky. And there are some things that can help you. First, uh, it, it should be a librarian or a person at your university or faculty. And the second, there is a truly mixer. And it doesn't look like this, but like a mixer where you can put a lot of licenses and then they'll, they tell you, are they um, compatible or not? So, so be careful about that. And, and um, that's, that's the last thing I wanted to, to say. So this is an excellent.